Um, so to introduce you, so uh, we're going to do an amazing webinar today on high impact performance, shifting learning into the flow of work. So Andy Lancaster, if you don't know who's now the head of learning at CIPD, uh, has just written a book, an amazing book called Driving Performance Through Learning. Um, and I think in terms of our Fuse audience, I think you'll find a message here is going to be really exciting. It's really in tune with the beliefs that we have and that everything that we've been doing to enable this through, through our services and technology. So over to Andy, uh, tell us about how to drive performance through learning. Thanks very much and, and a massive thank you to everybody at Fuse for the opportunity to uh, yeah, to come and share some thoughts around this, this particular theme. So um, we're going to spend an hour and there's going to be lots of interaction. So don't think you're just going to um, sit and listen to me talking about this. We're going to have various activities. We've got polls and, and chats and there's a chance for some Q&A as well. So we're going to think about how do you really shift learning um, into the flow of work. And that's the kind of the, been the thing which has been really on my mind over the last year or so, particularly thinking about uh, the future of learning. So just to um, uh, re-emphasize there, make sure in your chat window you've got you set to all panelists and attendees because we, we do want your uh, contribution here. Um, and, and also, this is a socialized environment. So actually, we learn as a group together. So whilst I might have some things to throw into the webinar, it's really important that we recognize that your perceptions and your own uh, insights on this uh, are really important so this is this f into the flow of work this phrase has been kind of hanging around LD for some time and there's there's been one or two um, particular um, thought leaders who've kind of gathered around this Josh Burson has been using this term in the flow of work and then you've got people like Harold Jarkey who are making interesting comments like learning is work and work is learning which kind of sounds right um, I'm not sure all work is learning but there is this sense that in actually doing the job that's where, where we learn so um, I guess the reason for writing the book and what I'm going to share with you uh, in the time we've got today was I kept get asking in, in going and delivering at conferences people get to have you got anything around how we can do this shift to, to make it less dependent on courses and more about how do we deliver deliver learning in a natural sense in, in the workplace. And I was kind of giving PowerPoint decks away, those kind of things. Now, it just got to the point where I thought this is time to write this down. So um, yeah, I, I guess a bit of a shameless plug. This is the book, Driving Performance Through Learning. And this is all about how do you move from a dependency on courses to the point where the natural approach to learning and the natural DNA and thinking in the organization is that learning just occurs in what we're doing. Whilst we will still go on courses, there's still a place for those. That's not the necessarily the go-to. And I guess the, the book is four sections. And that's important because I'm going to do a little bit from each section during the hour with, with interactions with you. So the first one is if we're going to move into the flow of work, we need to understand that organizational landscapes have changed massively so organizations are very different I'm going to do a little bit about how you can track some of those changes and then there's some real sense about we've got to change the foundations for this because we've got so deep rooted foundations about doing things sometimes in an old paradigm so I'm going to show you some of the essential foundations and then we've got to think about new learning approaches now, I'm going to cover one in particular we're going to look around socialized learning and obviously the guys at Fuse are really uh, on the metal on this, but we need to understand there's other things as well. And I'll, I'll maybe drop some of those in things like um, coaching, peer coaching is back in vogue again. And we're seeing that uh, raise that value mistakes, curated content, obviously digital. So the way we're going to do learning is very different. And then lastly, as we kind of draw towards the end of the hour, just going to throw a few ideas around what the re redefined L&D function is going to look like, because it will need uh, to look different. And um, I'm going to give you some free ideas around what we're tracking at CIPD around some of those differences. So there's four kind of things, questions we're going to look at. Why must we break free from an addiction to courses? An addiction is a strong word and we're going to use a strong word because there are addictions to delivering courses. Then we're going to think around how we need to now start thinking about working backwards from the organizational goal and really getting away from learn some learning needs analysis, which frankly, the, the, the they're broken methods, and I'm going to give you some of the evidence around why learning needs analysis is quite broken. Then we're going to spend a, a good slug looking at how do we make collaborative learning really work. And then I said at the end, I'm going to do some, some must-dos in terms of the transformation of the team. So first of all, we're going to look at um, addictions to courses. I won't ask you in the chat window what your addiction might be because that's personal to you. But hey, you know, I, I drink lots of tea. So you know, in general life, there are things which become behavioral patterns for all of us. 
And what I guess my initial proposition is, in organizations, there is no doubt in my mind that we have a sense of addiction uh, to courses. And this is what we're going to just cover for a few moments there, thinking about why that may be a real challenge for us. But I'm going to start with Lewis Carroll and um, Alice um, through the, the looking glass. These, these images are a little bit blurry here, but they're the originals and they, they are quite amazing now when you look at these. And this is written in, in 1871. And Lewis Carroll was not regarded particularly as a futurologist, yes, an, an author, but he wasn't known for his visionary thinking. And yet he wrote this fantastic section called The Red Queen's Race. And I'm just going to read you a little bit. Um, this is Alice speaking. She says, well, in our country, said Alice panting a little, you generally get to get somewhere if you run very fast for a long time, as we've been doing. And the Queen replies, a slow sort of country. Now here, you see it takes all the running you can do just to keep in the same place. And if you want to get somewhere else, you've got to run at least twice as fast as that. And what I want to kind of throw in at the beginning is this is moving faster now. And what we're seeing in learning development, obviously I have a privilege in my role to spend a lot of time globally with L&D teams looking in different sectors. What we're seeing is that people have had this sense that we're running fast now, but we may not seem to be getting where we need to be. And, and that's a, a real challenge for us. And what we do at CIPD is we tend to view um, the landscape through three lenses, which are work, workforce, and uh, workplace. So I'm just going to show you some of the changes which we're tracking here. So work itself is changing. Models are being disrupted everywhere. We, we, we can, you know, it doesn't matter what sector you're in, there are changes to the way we're actually doing work and business. And in a sense, the past achievements, the things we used to do, no longer guarantee us those kind of successes. So we've got to be thinking differently. Um, with data now, intuition counts for little. The days when you just had a hunch and that drove your business model. You know, data insights, all those kind of things, have, it's very clear that we have a very different way of working. And we, we have a much more rapid response now. So um, in many organizations now where slow delivery was acceptable, now most of us are getting a bit cheesed off if the, if, if the post of delivery takes more than a day or so. So this is changing the very nature of the organizations in, in which we work. And again, you can see on the slide there, there's lots of things and we're recording the session. Those of you who are joining us on the record, uh, welcome to you as well. Um, hope you feel really part of what we're doing here, even though you're kind of listening in. Uh, on what's going on. So work is changing, but also the workforce is changing massively. I'm not a great one for um, generational stereotypes. Uh, yeah, that's a bit of bunkum, to be honest with you. Um, bless, I mean, my mum's in, a, she, mum's in her 80s now, and she's using tech quite happily. And we need to recognise that not all millennials are tech savvy, you know. But there, there is no doubt that we have a greater range of age groups in the workplace, people working longer, people entering earlier. And I think perhaps the key one to show you here is we have very different types of work engagement now, full-time, part-time, flexible, shared, home working. The concept that we all as a workforce work in the same building, that just isn't the case anymore. And there's, there's evidence to show that um, things like performance management is changing, the expectations of staff are changing. Um, at one time, salary was all you were looking for. Now we're looking for lots of other rewards. So the expectations are very different in the workforce and learning is one of those those kind of key things and just to finish the, the three the workplace is changing massively so just out of interest in the chat window um how many of you work from home at any point let's just have a few yes and no's here let's just kind of get you uh, all typing away so look at this this is crazy isn't it if we'd asked this question 10 15 years ago it just wouldn't have been the case so yes most of us nearly all of us uh we look yeah yeah so um Uta's working a few days a week Kirsten, 90% of your time, Kirsten, is working from, from home. So um, it just shows you the concept of running courses in buildings. It just doesn't work for us um, in the same way now with such uh, different workplaces. And I was talking to the guys before we went live with you and just saying I delivered a webinar not too long ago from McDonald's because I couldn't get home in time. My workplace was delivering a qualifications webinar with a cheeseburger. How cool is that? That, that was the workplace on the day. So what we've got is, is just a recognition that things need to look different now. And I love this picture. I just yeah, got it from, I think it's from Pixabay, from one of those great sites. It says, dream it, believe it, and achieve it. There is this sense of, unless we have a different view about this, it's quite difficult. Now, um, I worked in rehab for about five years as head of HR and learning for one of the big rehab charities, working with those suffering with substance misuse challenges, be that heroin, cocaine, and alcohol, those kind of things. And, and what we found was 
that the change model started with a very compelling vision of why things need to be different. It's very difficult to change ingrained habits, which is why I use the word addiction. We are in organizations, often it's, it's really ingrained in the way we, you know, people expect learning is through going on a course. We need to visualize it separately. So learning uh, must kind of look uh, different. And to that end, I think addiction to formal course, when I say addiction, We've got evidence at CIPD, and I'm going to throw some re a report um, link in, in a moment, um, which shows that senior leaders, many senior leaders, if you ask them what their perception of learning is, they're still thinking around formal courses. And again, you might even have this in your scenarios, folks, that um, people might not think they've been on any learning unless they've been on a course and had a cup of tea and a brownie and lunch out. You know, so we have this kind of uh, addiction to, to thinking in this way. And what we're seeing is it really affects the agility of learning. It's a slow process designing and putting on formal courses. We've used models like ADDI and training cycle, where often it's a kind of a linear process and it takes an awful lot of time to actually create a product which can then be of use. And, and the, the concept of co-designing with stakeholders and all these kind of things really slow us up. So I guess that the premise of learning in the flow of work and the book Driving Performance Through Learning, what we're saying is we need to have a far more agile way of designing learning through minimum viable propositions, through iterative design, through getting great small solutions out into the workplace. And what we also see just, and here's the report here, Professionalizing Learning and Development. I think we've got the link. We can just drop that into the, uh, the chat window. Thank you, Imogen. That's perfect. Um, so this is a report I helped co-author um, earlier this year. It seems like an age ago. But we looked at the whole thing about professionalizing learning and development. And it was quite a big sample. And we looked at the kind of development needs that we as a profession need. I've got some challenge around even saying professionalizing learning and development. Someone said, what you can be in learning and development, not be professional. Mm, I think you can. Um, I think professionalism is about really embracing professional development and the kind of the new world. So what's really interesting in this report is that there was a vicious cycle, which we, we spotted, where senior leaders who maybe expect courses are then putting those expectations on the learning team who are delivering as order takers. They tend to kind of, we're, we're being under pressure here to deliver courses. And then you've got staff who don't think they've been in learning unless they've been on a course. And then the senior leaders don't think the learning team are particularly innovative because they're delivering courses. And we found this terrible, vicious cycle. So we've got to kind of break free from that one. And just to say, I stood back in writing the book and thought, what are the, the transformational things in my life which are really making a difference? And you know, Spotify has been one of those. I'm not particularly um, sharing that one as a promotion, but Spotify has really changed the way that I kind of have music in the flow of life um, and what was really great about it, incredibly flexible I can download if I've got wi-fi I can listen online but I can download um, all the songs which are useful for me it's incredibly accessible uh, I just love the way that um, it's it, it provides such an easy interface to use it's collaborative I can look at what my friends have on their lists and uh, yeah, and you can share other people's downloads and other people's playlists it's tailored it even comes up with brilliant recommendations for me and it created a massive step change as someone who travels a lot in the way that I consume music in the flow of life and what I'm going to sort of propose to you is that in this new world we need to move from formal courses to flexible accessible collaborative tailored learning which causes a step change in organizations and for that the formal course struggles and we'll see uh, during the other there's some other options in there so it is time to upgrade our guidance software recently driving up to a conference in Manchester and the car went a bit crazy and said I was on uh, I was I was off a, um, a, a navigable road I wasn't it's just that this new road wasn't on my software and I guess just to kind of close the section before we do some chat I think for L&D teams we've got to update our guidance software in in many of the organizations that it isn't naturally putting us on a road which is about formal courses, but allowing us to think far more about great resources which can be accessed in the flow of work, self-directed learning, where learners have far more control. And it does require a kind of a software upgrade. So the first kind of chatty bit, um, and Steve, I guess this is where we can come in here. Um, I guess there's a question from me to you guys is to do you recognize it might be a strong word for you do you recognize addictions to courses that people are expecting this and i guess what are some of the key changes that are really impacting learning in your context so that's the kind of the end of the first section any thoughts steve from yourself on that one before and we, we can let guys go in the chat window uh what what's your thought around learning addictions to courses yeah. no no so i, I mean I, I love it i love it and i think it's 
um, obviously we've been talking about this a, a long, a long time. And you know, as an as an organisation, we built Fuse as the opposite end. So we built Fuse initially as a peer to peer learning platform and as a completely informal platform. So what I learned, I guess, in my first generation of building a, 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 a learning company, a learning tech company, was I got to the end of my previous company not being able to get through one of those e-learning courses. So although I didn't know what the answer was, I knew definitely the course answer wasn't it when we couldn't get through it and the results show people don't go back to that and search and find the information we do to. So, so I think I'm completely in tune with that as a point. I think what's interesting though is, though, is to get to the place that we're talking about, that uh, we have to not, we have to look at the whole thing, right? So designing and thinking backwards and problem is the right step. Your data and understanding value, absolutely. And then to the point, right, then the, the, next, the next point is, how do you then build all the knowledge that people need to search for? So how do we, how do we think about content completely differently? And how do we think about the architecture of technology to allow us to get to the, not, and not just the object. So this is where we're thinking in, in, our, in our technology roadmap, not just, we, we went from kind of macro to micro. So, and if you look at, we did a few school, we built a thousand videos that explains every concept of the secondary school curriculum, which is what our, our clients do um, on the commercial side. So that's great that a kid can search for atoms or algebra, you know, the specific parts and exactly the same for our, co our commercial clients who are searching at that concept level. Yeah. I think what we're talking about now is going the next level down and how do you use, and I don't want to get too techie here, but, but as we're building out our future architecture, we're building things into the technology that allows you to, you know, if you've got an article, that's a procedure, how does it, how do you just search for step yeah, two yeah. of the procedure and it brings out just that. So I think there's, there's two or three elements here. There's yeah, the on design. There's the content, how do I rethink my content strategy? And then there's a, how does the, where does the technology uh, become a marriage with that content piece? Yeah, no, that's, I mean, it's just looking in the, the chat there and some really good, you guys are incredibly fast at typing, which is just very impressive. <laughs> um, but Uta says our, our staff are very academic and love conferences and courses and combine that with technophobes. So I guess that, yeah, we, I've seen that one too, that actually it's not only that we love our co conference and course, that also we get a bit scared by some of the technology around this. Um, yeah, I think it's David here. We've got here. We do have a default of must attend a course, but I love this. God, this is calling it out, isn't it? But it's more about getting a rest from the everyday trudge of work as well as learning. And do you know what? That's going to be for some of you. That's going to be a, ma a massive challenge because this is almost as a rite of passage that we have the right to go on days away with a really nice lunch. And you know, if you're going to go learning in the flow of work and change that culture, that is a real challenge. So I was talking to you recently, which. Uh, someone who's looking at kind of future said you know what one of the challenges we're gonna have about air flight is that we all know that flying is really challenging in terms of global sustainability but do you know what all over the world managers and executives are collecting their air miles and getting their free holidays so you know what you're saying here is there's an underlying thing uh, within some organizations that it's kind of almost our right to do this um we've got yes there can be an emphasis um, on physical course. I work for a staff and volunteers often responding to difficult, complex needs, including su uh, suicide ideation. Okay, so that's a really, yeah, I, I, having worked in rehab for many years, you know, that's, th there's a sense of being together. And I, I guess what I'm saying here um, is, I'm just trying to click on the name there and just see who, who it is. It's Rachel. Um, so Rachel, I think you're right here. We're not saying that the course is not relevant. I think where we need to be physically together is absolutely right. It's just that so often we don't use the physical time together for the most important things when we could be doing learning in the flow of work. Uh, but again, we're finding things like buddies and, and coaching are really, are really cool around those. Um, and I think, again, and, so you, yeah, and, go for it. Yeah. I think Andy, what you what you're saying, which I think I'm in tune with, right? I think what you're saying is that the course is no longer the centerpiece of learning design. So in, yep. the, in the old way, whatever the problem was, the answer is you start thinking about the course first. Right? That's the first thing that you do. And, yep. and I think what, you're, what we are completely agree with and I'm in tune with is say, look, it's still there. It's probably changed. It's probably more high value and it's probably more discussion, facilitation, practice than it is delivery of knowledge. And what we're suggesting is the moving out of the knowledge piece that is take time to build that knowledge, know that if you deliver it in the classroom, then that knowledge piece is gonna be forgotten. Most of it's forgotten by the time you wanna apply it. I mean, sometimes yeah. knowledge may not be needed for years. Um, yeah. So yeah. If we get the knowledge bit out, then we use the classroom for the, the courses or the classroom piece for the high value piece. Absolutely right. I think absolutely spot on. I, and I think that's where we've got to sh see the value shift. So Mary says in here, we moved to a 70, 20, 10 mentality in our learning off, which is great. And, and 
Charles and the guys, Charles Jennings and the guys around this. Uh, again, but what we're seeing is it's not, we know it's not about the numbers, but what this is a shift to say, how do we get to the, the 17? How do we create? So in a sense, if we're looking at models and they are but models, um, flawed models, but they are models that are useful. Uh, it, it's how do we wean ourselves away from that? So some really good perception. So thanks guys in the chat window. That's been brilliantly good. And um, I'm just envying your ability to type without typographic errors in here so thank you for that, that that's great so again you might want to go back and scroll through some of the the chat here some really really interesting things so i'm conscious um second section okay so we we've kind of established that courses have a place but this is not our default go-to anymore we've got to think about our initial uh, our initial reaction thought is that when learning is needed it needs to be as accessible and close to the workplace as possible so well, I guess in the second section of the book, I look around some of the things about how do you make some of the foundational changes. And one of these is working backwards from organizational goals. Um, and I'm going to show you in a minute um, a number of reasons. And these are evidence-based reasons why learning needs analysis just don't work often. Okay, it doesn't mean they can't work. But our old traditional learning needs analysis is a pretty spent uh, model. So firstly, I just want to say, Often you see in organizations that there are fragmented views in defining what performance or learning need is. And if you've been around learning as long as I have, and even if you're new to this, I bet you found this, you go and talk to the leaders and they have one view about what the issue is. The managers <clears throat> have a different view. The staff, who are often the ones who are trying to perform and do the job, have a very different view as well. So you could have something where, <clears throat> excuse me, you could have um, customer service challenges, you know, orders are slow. And maybe we've got customers complaining around this. And the leaders say, we can't, we can't have this kind of terrible customer service here. We need to do something about this. What we need is a management refresher um, to help all our teams to be really good in customer service. And you go to the managers and they say, we're running with 20% uh, vacancies right now. And we can't seem to recruit the right staff. And what we're doing is we're recruiting the wrong people who just don't stay. And the managers say, it's not about uh, our customer service skills. This is actually about a recruitment issue, which we need support with. And then you go and talk to the staff and they say, well, you know, there was a new IT system put in for customer service about six months ago, and there was no adequate training for this. And we just can't use the system adequately. So I guess what, what we've got to do is to recognize the fragmented perception of learning needs. We somehow have to get around this. And the only way we can do this, as we'll see in a moment, is through really targeted performance consulting conversations. But first, I just want to take you through why I, I believe learning needs analysis are a really weak uh, area for, for L&D and performance perspectives. And I've just got some quick thoughts on this one, because again, in a moment, we're just going to have some general chat around it. So this is why learning needs analysis have not served us well. Firstly, they start with a learning lens. It's a learning needs analysis. Therefore, when we start thinking about learning, the natural outcome is a self-fulfilling prophecy. We end up with a learning solution. And we cannot go into these kind of situations necessarily thinking learning is the challenge or the, or, or the solution. Often there are other performance things around this which are the solution rather than thinking about some kind of learning uh, need. Also, most organizations are incredibly complex ecosystems and it isn't simple. It isn't simply saying if we did this little bit of learning, be that great digital learning or a course that we're going to fix it. What we're seeing is that really smart L and D functions are recognizing that they're in a complex ecosystem. And in many ways, this kind of takes us into the realm of organizational design and development as well, where we need to get beyond thinking about learning needs analysis into more complex ecosystem analysis. And that's not difficult, but it just means that we need to look a bit wider. Also, there's just not enough analysis in learning needs analysis. Um, it's it's no, learning needs guesses often. You know? So what we're seeing is now, again, if we're really going to drive performance in organizations and we're going to get learning into the flow, it needs a far more forensic approach, uh, which I'll show in a minute. Performance consulting conversations at least move us forward on that one. So we've got to get a bit more analysis into thinking and trying to have hypotheses. What do we think is going on here and what might be our solution? Also, key voices aren't heard. Often the learners, <clears throat> the learner voice is very weak in the learning needs analysis. We get secondhand information from managers, um, you know, or someone has a guess at what's going on. And the reason we can't get to the staff is they're too jolly busy to engage uh, or be allowed to engage with us. So learning needs analysis don't allow us to have the conversation often uh, in the right place which means we end up relying on subjective sec secondary uh, sources. Um, 
don't know how any of you have ever waded through a stack of appraisals. God, I've been there. Uh, of course, because the performance appraisal will give us the insights into what the needs are. It's a jolly subjective process anyway. Most of us know that sometimes uh, you know, our appraisal is hardly rigorous in what goes on. Um, so what we're then doing is we're then putting huge weight on secondary sources and hearsay when actually we need to get far uh, deeper than that. And also valid data. There's a whole section of the book looking at impact and data. But again, it's sometimes difficult to get some solid data around this. And we'll see in a moment through performance consulting conversations, we can actually get to the data a bit, a bit more easily. And also learning these analysis are sometimes incredibly slow. Um, you know, we, we need to be diagnosing and turning solutions around really quickly and in lots of organizations it's weeks or months before we get a solution so those are some of the reasons why i think the lna often is really serving us poorly so i think we've got a poll we're going to launch here where i'm going to just get you a chance to recognize which weaknesses you think are things that you've come across and i think you can do multiple votes here so time to click away guys um, you can see the the poll has come up here um, I'm not allowed to vote on this one. How undemocratic is that? But I'll trust you guys will represent us really well. Um, but for me, I think probably for me, one of the key things is a lack of forensic analysis. And it's something that I have to um, think about in my own practice. So um, when we think we've got the votes in uh, on this one, if you uh, want to close that one up, but vote away and let's just see what we think is symptomatic in our organizations. The weakness is about learning needs analysis. How are we doing on polls? Obviously, I can't, I can't see this, so I'm just trusting you guys massively. How good to work um, as partners in this, and we've never had a chance to do this before. So, okay, do you wanna close the poll and let's publish the results? Can you publish the results? That'd be brilliant. So let's see what, okay, so, oh, wow, is it? Look, the top ones, key voices aren't heard and we haven't got valid data. Isn't that, doesn't that just make you wanna, it's, it's so sad, more than half of you, and thank you for your honesty, are saying in the way we do our learning needs analysis in terms of driving performance, the key voices in the organization just are not being heard. And data, this is a constant one. Sadly, we haven't got time to talk about data today. Maybe, Steve, I can come back again another time and give some uh, perceptions on that. But it's really, it, it, it's, it's important we recognize that learning needs analysis is just a very broken uh, process. So just before we have some more chat, um, when we wrote the professionalizing learning and development uh, report, it's really interesting, um, quite shocking in some ways. 42% of leaders, just over 40% of leaders didn't think the L&D team had enough business acumen or the business acumen they'd expect. So what the leaders think the L&D team should have wasn't there. And what was really interesting, 90% of the L&D uh, folks in the survey, in the research, said, we think this is an issue for us. So we've got to up the game on critical insight uh, into organizations. Uh, both the leaders and staff can see that. So the way to get around this quickly to say is we start with the end in mind. Um, we don't start with the learning thing. We look at what the what the clear business need and performance need is. And it's just a, a, a complete reversal of how we might historically have done this. And for that reason, what we need to do is use far more targeted consultative conversations. <coughs> in, the, in the book, I distilled about six performance consulting models and came up with about 20 questions, which you may want to have by the side of the table when you when you when you kind of talking to folks there so you, i can't do all of those now we don't have time but the, the the essence of this is you've got to get to the right people you've got to map the full ecosystem of who's involved with this but what we need to do is the probing diagnostic questions to really understand what the issue is and to think far more systemically and that kind of just takes us into some work by Joshua Retz. You can go and find this uh, online, 702010 Institute. And some of you have heard this shift. We've got to go from being order takers, which are operational people, up to that top right-hand corner, which is around value creation. And value creation is where we're actually really influencing the bottom line of what's going on. So um, that's kind of just a reflective slide on that one. But Steve, I'll have a sip of water. Um, yeah, any thoughts from you? But guys, we've got to get we've got to get in that top right hand corner where we're really creating value in the organisation. Yeah, and I think maybe while you have you sit, I think so. We talk the same language really, which is I, I, maybe similar to, the, to Charles's thing here. How do L and D the normal role is is problem solvers. So I think we get to value creators by prioritising the problems that we can solve, um, and then understand and then ranking them by effort and value. 
Yep. Uh, often, for example, you know, I think now as, as we've learned this and we're obviously partnering, we, we do a lot of work directly with Charles uh, and Charles yep. does what's called a, a, proof of, a proof of impact. So they, they go into organizations, uh, into our clients and spend you know, 20, 30 days looking at you know, often a sales area, which is you know, the easiest one to have that, that boost inside and actually to prove a uh, measurable difference. And what they didn't do is look at a role, um, understand what the high performer looks like, understand what the normal behavior looks like, the normal <clears throat> looks like, look at that delta of difference, and then it's measurable. So you can easily yeah. measure that delta of difference. And then, and then you've got your hypothesis. You've got a hypothesis that says, if we can shift the average, the delta medium, closer towards a high performer, we can measure that as, as an outcome and prove that value. Yeah. And I th yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Just <clears throat> looking in a chat window, um, the 702010, the little black boxes institute on there. Um, really interesting question from Davina here. And I think this is where the rubber really hits the road. How, it says, how can we have consultative conversations in very large geographically dispersed organizations that are representative of the employee base? So I think this is about representative samples in large organizations, getting to the right people. And with technology now, there are ways of doing uh, engagement activities with large dispersed organizations. So I think for me, the, the challenge around this is actually asking the right questions is, is the starting place, what we're trying to do to diagnose what people need. And this also is, involves how do you think this might be best supported. It, it may well not be anything to do with learning, but if it is to do with learning, <clears throat> we might have an organization who are just thinking, well, courses are great, but what we just need is a neat little bit of um, some, some, some micro video from the staff, sharing best practice, great practice would be a really good thing. Um, Vivi says there, we work with personas based on massive research. So that's another great approach here where you create typical personas which help you to focus your thinking so so that's a that's a, a an interesting one we just have to be a little bit careful with personas i think that sometimes we 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 drop into a whole new set of stereotypes but i'm with you vivi that that, that gives us a chance sometimes to think about who we need to talk to um so persons and yet yeah, uh, user journeys can be really important so i guess on this section what we're saying is we need to reverse the thing round. We don't come at this with a learning needs analysis thinking that learning is naturally going to be the solution. What we go and we go and talk to the people who really matter and we find out what the issue is. And like I said at the beginning of this section, with fragmentation, you can end up getting very different views. There's that old Indian proverb about all, all these different, um, I think it was uh, fo folks um, engaging with an elephant and they all had a different view because they were all kind of grabbing hold of different bits of the elephant and that's what we get on this one so what we've got to do is to get away from a fragmented view here that um this is what we need to actually saying what does the organization truly need uh even given in, the, in a given situation so again that um you can find that report um it's, I'll put there Josh, Josh Retz. So he's part of um, the team at 702010 Institute. So it's a free report you can get online. I found it really helpful. Um, you know, this is, this is not new stuff about being value creators, but there's some really nice thinking under there in that model um, where you can actually see about how you move. And also just notes on there as well, learning enablers. You can be strategic, but you're still not necessarily in a position where um, you have the gravitas or the leverage to do the absolute what, what's needed in there so we need to recognize that we've got to get strategic into that top uh, right hand corner again thank you for the um some great chat there as well well done on that one that's absolutely um, absolutely brilliant and Andy, so, just, yeah go for it steve yeah just really briefly so um we've actually done a video uh, with charles and yoss on the model um so there's a two three minute video anybody Perfect. Wants to that um, let us know. We'll share the link out for you. That's perfect. Um, and it just shows, you know, um, we're, we're going to come on to the third section now, which is um, thinking about social collaboration. This is where it's so vital that we're in things like this. Uh, why do I want to work at CIPD? I'll tell you why. Because actually being part of a massive professional network is really exciting. And this is where we share practice. Um, so it's, yeah, it's an important thing that we, we don't get isolated here and we work with others. So having kind of talked about organizations changing um, and we need to think about um, a new view of the organization and also we need to start back to front and we need to think more about performance consulting. The third section of the book is, is around some of the techniques you can use to get learning in the flow of work. And um, hey, I've got a copy of the book in front of me on the desk as I would have. But the kind of things that you, you can find in the book, I'm just going to do social in this next section. Um, leveraging digital is a no brainer. Obviously, we've got to look about digital techniques if we're going to help people to learn in the moment in the flow of work. But there's stuff around facilitating community practice. I've 
the whole thing around curating content, we seem to have got a little bit stuck on curation. Um, it kind of, we like the thought of it, but it's a bit more tricky. So curating content with purpose is in there. There's a whole section on supporting self-directed learning. What does it mean to empower learners and to help learners to learn how to learn, which is a bit meta, but we need to do that. I've revisited coaching, particularly in the, the sense of coaching in the moment with peers coaching each other. And also I've got a chapter in there on, on learning from mistakes, which is one of the ones which just did my head in. Why we don't use mistakes more in terms of helping people learn is a mystery, but probably because often we're in blame cultures, but that's an, another story. So we're going to spend a little bit of time just thinking about social and how I think social collaboration is at the heart of learning in the flow of work. So this comes from Albert Bandura. This is not new stuff. So uh, Bandura said most human behavior is learned observationally. You and I watch other people and we pick stuff up. Um, so one form is an idea or new behaviors as a result of being in that socialized environment. So we learn from one another via imitation, by role modeling, those kind of things. And if we look back, this isn't, it's like we suddenly found socialized learning as some massive like, well, hey, look what we found. This has been going on ad infinitum. So if you look in the top left hand um, corner there, I mean, you'll, you'll see that um, in cave times, how did you learn how to hunt or make fire? The cave paintings quite show that there was a narrative in early communities that socialized environments was how you learned how to do things. Then you move on the top right hand corner to guilds where you, you see particular trades had their own guilds where socially, again, they learned skills, they passed on expertise. Bottom left hand corner, anybody who thinks the fact that we're now working in coffee shops is something um, novel, you need, we need to look back and, and see in the, in the, in the 1700s, um, coffee shops were where businesses were pioneered and a great one here um, you can see Jonathan's coffee shop the principal place of the city stockbrokers um, Lloyd's of London came out of a coffee shop um, so what we're seeing is historically this has always been um, something it's just that we're now waking up a bit more particularly because of the digital um, you know empowerment that we, we now have for socialized learning and just to say kids I mean this is children just this is how they learn until we stick them in a formal classroom with a rigid curriculum and then we just squeeze some of the learning joy out of young people because of the way sometimes education works. Uh, and I can say that because I trained as a teacher and, and lectured in uh, teacher training for a time, although being going back a little bit. But we need to recognize this is a natural way of doing things. Now, a little bit of the research, going back to professionalizing learning development, that super report, which we put the, um, well, I say super report, I helped write it, so I've got to be a bit careful there, but I think it is a super report. And you can get that free of charge. What we found is that organizations that facilitate social learning in the flow of work are twice as likely to have learning flexibility and four times as likely to facilitate continuous learning. Thanks, Imogen, again, for putting the, um, uh, the link in. That's perfect. So I, I guess these are natural things. But what we're saying is if you want flexible, continuous learning, then grasping the whole thing around socialized, shared peer environments are absolutely vital. And it is happening right now. It's just that often it's under the radar. There is always a go-to person in most organizations who um, kind of will be sharing the knowledge and you just know you need to go and talk to them. If you're trying to remember how to do a pivot table, you know, don't go and do the crummy e-learning. You know, you go and talk to Madge and Madge is the one who knows how to do the pivot table and socially together over a cup of tea, you remind yourself. So we know that socialized learning is really important. And what was really interesting in Jane Hart's, if you haven't come across this, you can Google this. Jane Hart does a nice piece of research around top learning tools. Well, you have to be a little bit careful because it's an online um, survey which tends to favor people who are a bit more online but nevertheless just have a look at this within the top 15 learning tools the ones with stars are socialized uh, um, tools socialized solutions so what we're seeing now is the evidence is and it's across workplaces education now that socialized environments be that LinkedIn Google drives WordPress all these kind of things we're just getting into Microsoft teams this collaborative um, you know approach uh, is really important for us so just a few things why social learning before we have another chat. Um, here's some reasons why socialized learning, I think, does really work for us. And this comes partly from Etienne, Etienne Wenger's work around community practice. It really targets performance improvement. It's, it's a laser, clinical laser way of, of, of supporting people. And particularly, it really does support learning in the flow. This happens, these socialized things happen as we work. It really helps self-directed learning. So we're helping learners to really access and support their own needs. 
again, it levers digital connections, which is probably why it's taking off so much now that we are connected. Um, while we've even been here, I've got my phone next to me. We can never be away from it. I've got messages coming in from people. So that live digital conversation is happening. It helps also embed formal learning. So if you want your formal things courses to be really effective, then gather social around it. Problem solving, another key part of learning is really um, supported with this. And also, communities of practice are really energized when we get this kind of socialized learning in place so just to say on this one i'm conscious of time i'm just going to ask you a question in the chat window um, what do you reckon is the key benefit of socialized learning in your context if you could choose one thing you say do you know what i think the socialized thing would really support and benefit us let's have a look at what your views are here why you think so the, you, you type away. We'll, we'll have a chat while the guys type away. So the, the primary thing in your context, why you think a socialized peer environment is so crucial. Yeah, we'll let, let the guys type. We'll have a quick chat, Steve. Yeah, and I think, I think so, Andy, I think, so there's two points I, I make to this, right? There's social, there are benefits of social as, as a standalone concept. Ideally to embed those new habits, because we are talking about the creation of new habits uh, within an organization. So often what we found is to create those habits is best to embed them into, let's say, the, you know, your, your more formal program. So the programs are onboarding, which is a program that's going to last for six weeks. But you, you can therefore force some of those new habits of social learning to happen inside. And we've, we've got many clients that have, when they've redesigned the programs from, from outward in, that they've, yep. baked in that, they've baked in activities which, does, which people don't get to think about, don't think, should I or shouldn't I do this? And all of a sudden they're creating content, they're collaborating online because it's just part of their program. So I think there's the yeah. piece around how you help create the habits. And it, in terms of measurement, I think there's, there's two parts. There's one is social as a part of the wider program. So if you're helping design a sales program or customer services, social is a part of that. So you're not measuring it independently, you're measuring yep. the whole thing. And, and then secondly, I think the, the social part, the other thing you, you probably can look at is social learning as a way to, to help with staff retention uh, and attraction. So yeah. you've created a culture, you know, whereby people are now, because what, what social learning can do is connect people greater to the organization. And, you know, and, and also I look, really look forward to when we meet up because I guess yeah. I go to historic England or a, uh, English heritage, you know, organization, you recognize there's so many rich stories in the head of people. Those type yeah. of stories socialized yeah as a tribe, you know, in a campfire tribe, but on a much wider network towards it, it's a type of thing that creates greater connections with the, with the wider organization. Yeah, no, that's ab absolutely spot on. I think that the power of narratives is a whole webinar in there about storytelling, isn't there? But guys, I'm not gonna call them all out specifically, but have a look in the chat window. There's some, just some brilliant stuff in here. Collaboration is big in there and sharing, sharing stories, experiences. Um, Nina says developing ideas together. So there's creativity linked to this. So this is really crucial that we understand that this is something that we need to go. So brilliant um, observations there. And guys, just have a scroll through there. But what I want to just um, highlight to you is we go around organizations and sometimes socialized learning communities, particularly online, are some of the most desolate places that you will find. Someone, um, I, went, I was working recently, um, I wouldn't say which one, um, with a major bank. And the, the, the learning manager just wilted back into, I won't say he or she, their chair and said, we set up this socialized environment and the only people who are using it are the vegan cookery group. And it was just like, you could feel the pain. And I said, what you need to do is go and work out why the vegan cookery group are finding this useful because they were sharing and they were connected. So often we need to recognize that just dumping a solution into the organization, whatever that might be, and I'm not gonna mention product names, unless we as learning folks know how to structure around that, they, they can be really desperate places. Uh, this is a piece of research from our research partners towards maturity, who I'm sure you've heard of, um, a report called Unlocking Potential. Um, and just to show you here, if you look at seven o'clock on here, so it's a bit of a complex diagram, but simply the gray line around the edge of this kind of spider diagram are priority skills and you can see facilitating socialized learning is a really priority one the the, the red or the raspberry colored line um there's there's some great description for you raspberry not just red um the raspberry colored line you can see those are the top 10 percent of learning organizations who are really still struggling with this and if you look at the average organization in blue you can see it's really low so we know the evidence would say we know this is good but we're struggling so just quickly, I'm going to go through in, um, the, in the chapter around socialized learning and communities. Um, I've got some, yeah, this model, I mean, models, again, you've got to be really careful. So please use this with care. Um, but what I've done is as going around organizations, whenever I found an organization who's got some momentum around this, 
I've just grabbed the ideas. And what it came up with me as I began to kind of formalize some thinking around this, there are seven C's. And I'm going to go through these really quickly. Um, but seven C's, which I think are really fundamental to uh, communities really working. First one, you need a cause or a concern or something of that nature at the center of this. You need gravity around this. People will only work effectively in learning communities if there's a passion to be there. So we cannot force people with a, you know, the classic we do, isn't it? We set up a program of some kind and we stick a community there and there isn't enough energy or gravity around that. So we need to understand that there's got to be a cause. It could be customer service. It could be new managers. It could be you've just joined the organization. But as learning professionals, we need to understand that cause is really important. We need to make a meaningful communities. Cultures are really important. Every organization has a culture and social learning communities have cultures as well. We need to think about what we're going to embody in the culture, what we're going to promote, how we can encourage people to have trust, be open, those kind of things. So don't assume. And the best way to get cultures established is not to talk about them but to role model them so the community itself role models a great culture we then got to think about in conditions you need a great environment and that could be face to face um, a really cool place where you can hang out we tend to to do this in museums in london with my team we go to museums and sit in one of the best conversations we had was in the turbine room at tate modern sitting on the floor looking up at the ceiling um, it was the right conditions for a great conversation but again in, in, in digital um scenarios we need great community places where we can hang around cadence is a really interesting word cadence tends to come from orchestras it's about rhythm or cycling those of you as cyclists will know that cadence is how fast your pedals are going around what i found is that community communities do really well have some kind of sense of cadence people know the rhythm of the community for both informal and formal interactions so i'm in yeah various communities i know when we get together and that's really important Next one's content. Um, great community seed brilliant content. Um, so sometimes you just got to keep the content in there. Really good provocative things that people can chat about and particularly get the community to share great content. That's a more powerful thing than even L&D or leaders uh, doing that. Contributions. Often we find there's lots of lurkers in communities. You might have heard the 99-1 model where kind of only about 1% of people are actually involved. What we need to do is encourage people around contributions. And the thing I found really interesting around this is working out loud. Um, the whole thing about how do we work out loud and share what we're doing. Simply share because we may not realize it, but what we're doing is really vital and important for other people. And lastly, credit. It's about thank yous. It's about acknowledging the support people have given all those kind of things again some communities are, are doing some really great stuff around credit um not saying digital badges because those can be a bit cheesy sometimes but you know what sometimes digital badges those kind of things are really important or roles within communities helping people to take a particular role and giving them credit is really important so these are not the only ones, but cause, culture, conditions, cadence, content, contributions, and credit. These are things I have found are underpinning communities which are working really well. So um, we've got a poll now, haven't we, again? So Imogen, can you throw the poll? Which, which do you think is the most neglected in any learning communities you've been in, experienced? So you've got one choice on this one. So choose wisely, as they said in the Indiana Jones film. Uh, choose wisely, please. You've only got one of these. So which one of these do you think is most neglected in a the typical learning communities is it that it hasn't got enough kind of gravity and cause is the culture not poor um is it not a great conditions in terms of the, the the place where you can hang around is there a rhythm issue that we just kind of lose a sense of purpose around this content are people not valued in terms of contributions or whatever so vote away and then we'll have a look um in a second so just having a look actually do you know we're right on time that's in Sounding good. So thank you. So Steve, do you want to just make a quick comment while we let people use their, their, one of their C's and then we'll just have a look at what the group reckons is the key blocker on this one. Yeah. And I, and I think we talked about the other, the other day, I think the, for, for us, the community piece, um, the other one here is, is context. So I guess you, you call this, I think cause, right? Yep. Um, so for us, I think again, and this maybe goes to Vivi's point, which she was talking through, um, that the, um, how do we how do we allow the organization still to find relevant content but still connect to the organization and obviously the in our world the setting up of communities is key to that because the community is your your filter of 
both your interest and the things you're going to. An organization may have a thousand communities, but it, it's getting that, that taxonomy, taxonomy right so that you're only filtering in. So when you're searching stuff, you're searching stuff relevant for you. When you're discovering stuff, you're discovering stuff searching for you. Know, for you. So for us, communities used intelligently can provide the filter of context. And I think that's a really, the context thing, we're probably on the same thing there, isn't it? That's the kind of the thing. Um, just a little, a li yeah, yeah, thanks, Image. That's brilliant. So, Jay, look at this interesting culture, the culture of the community, the thing that's doing them in. That's really interesting, isn't it? Um, and rhythm again. So, that's interesting. So, you guys, really interesting what you're finding. So, getting the culture right and also getting some sense of rhythm to make things really work seem to be real blockers for you. So, thank you for sharing. Uh, your thoughts around that one. I think, I don't think, to, I think to add to that, because I do, I do think, and it's, it's, it's a huge interesting point, isn't it? That um, you, can, you can have great technology, you can have great, great things in place, but if there's a couple of blockers, it makes it hard. So leadership yeah. is, is obviously absolutely key for this, right? That if your, your leadership uh, teams, you know, enjoy and thrive in a open collaborative environment, then it's, you, you're an open book. So, you know, for us, it's definitely easier within certain organizations that already have that culture where the senior leaders are open and collaborative and, and, and not command and control. So I think there's, there's yeah. that part for, you know, and I think that, I think the newer generation of leaders are very much, you know, in, more in this, in this tune. Uh, and obviously an organization that is the opposite to a blame culture. So as soon as you've got a blame culture, then, you know, yeah, people okay. are fearful of putting themselves out there for fear of being criticized. And therefore, how does an organization and how do leaders help change towards that culture? Yeah, and very much so. Yeah, so a lot of yeah, great work. Yeah, here. very much so. And some really great comments again, guys. Thank you for what you put in the chat window. Some really great stuff in here. So, you know, digital, um, Davina says digital being used more and more to facilitate these interactions. So, what about inclusions for locating people where internet connectivity is still not very good? That's a really good point, Davina. Do you know what's really interesting for us? We're now in a, we've now delivered qualifications about 160 countries digitally. Um, I'm not going to just call out one area of the UK just particularly, but I come from Norfolk and North Norfolk, I tell you what, there's some real dead spots in terms of connectivity there and we've had some countries where i thought there might have been an issue and they've got really really great connectivity so i think to davina's point there if we're going to be using um technology we need to just think through um about the experience that people get and that that needs a bit of road testing on that one so just to kind of um round, we've just got one very quick section and then hopefully there'll be some um yeah just some time for one or two questions at the end a reflective moment how are you developing your social professional learning network? You don't need to answer this one, but you know, this is so crucial for us guys. We need to be in the conversation. So it's very difficult to facilitate and model socialized learning environments if we don't experience ourselves. So I'd really encourage you to think, where are you hanging around? Obviously today is a, is a great example. I really appreciate the Fuse guys for providing this environment. We need more of these. So just to kind of finish off, this is quite a quick section. Um, the last section of the book, having looked at, the changing workplace, there's foundations here around consultation conversations and around data. And then there's a whole stack of different methods we need to use to get learning the flow of work, which social is a key one. This means L&D teams are going to have to be transformed a bit. So we become very familiar with the shape of the L&D universe. Um, this is... Some people call this the dipper. This is Ursa, part of Ursa Major. This is the plow. Okay, so we know what our universe, we know what it looks like. We feel comfortable when we look up into the sky and we recognize the plow. But you know what? You can join the dots very differently here. Um, and there's one dot actually missing in the top right hand corner there. I don't know where that one's gone to. But anyway, but you can join the dots. And what we need to understand is that our learning universe is being connected differently and it looks different and it has different demands and if we want to get really creative we can join the dots in very different ways and we need to think now creatively about reshaping our learning functions and not allowing the old model to so permeate our thinking that we can't think outside the box which is obviously what this particular in some ways it's actually quite hard to see the plow in it you can see it but do you know what um, I encourage you, you may not recognize your learning function in the next few years. And that's a really cool thing. So just to say, to, to kind of round this section, I'm just going to say we need a different L&D toolkit. Um, we need to think about some different things that we need. And what we've been doing at CIPD, and we've been role modeling this in our own team, is recognizing that we need some different skills and roles in here. So there's a little model in the fourth section, which I, I kind of cut up with the, the modern learning team um, kind of needs to do these six things. We need to direct diagnose design, deliver, deploy, and detect, okay? Those are key functions for us. Now, what I'm just about to throw up, and there'll be a, 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 quite a lot of information coming up here. I want you to look at the, the boxes that come up which you've got red lines around them, 
Okay, so these are some of the roles that we've been tracking, which are appearing in organizations now. Um, so obviously you'll see some of these head of learning, learning manager. We know these instructional designer, administrator. We know these uh, business partners even is not that new. But what we're seeing now is organizations who are really on the front edge of this are now seeing other roles. Things like data analysts are now part of what's going on. Performance consultants, digital asset creator was one of the most recent um, hires which we did at CIPD along with we've just hired a couple of community managers so you can see on designing and delivering it's not just about trainers now it's about communities coaching it's curation it's digital creation and you can also see on deploying now I've called out marketing and comms we now need to help people who are going to go in the flow of work to have far more sense of campaigns going on where we actually use marketing techniques to help people to understand what's available to them and perhaps last on detection, yeah, this impact tracking, guys, we're not going to get away with this. So data analyst and actually detecting the impact is really important. And just to kind of close this sort of section off, it kind of goes right back to the beginning. If we are diagnosing what the business challenge, the organization challenge is, then the impact tracking is just simply going back to that and seeing how, how we're turning the dial on it. So we've got to get much better from that, con that performance consulting conversation actually gives us the end point of what we're trying to, uh, to do there. So resourcing learning in the flow, I guess the question is, is this in-house? Well, I think some of these roles will be in-house. Some of these are going to be shared functions in most organizations. You might need to share something with a data analysts, with a, another department. But what we're also seeing is that the, the gig economy, where there's people with these great skills out there, um, you know, we, we may need to have gig workers around L&D teams who help us uh, with these specialisms. So just to round off before we got, yeah, we've got a, few, a couple of minutes for some questions. Four whys, not the only ones. Got to get free from addiction to courses. Got to work backwards. Performance consult. We've got to use a whole range of new methods and collaboration is a key one. And we've got to have a transformed L&D team with different roles in there. Four whys that really underpin impactful learning in the flow of work. So just to say... Thank you, by the way, Fuse guys, for allowing me to do this. We've got a discount for you. I, I've, I, I guess this is my chance to do a little pitch. The book is available at the Kogan Page website um, at DPTL, which is Driving Performance Through Learning. And if you put in that code there, guys, um, you get a 15% discount, which makes it cheaper than Amazon, which is really cool. So you don't have to buy that, but you know, the, the, it's 100,000 words, guys. There's loads of stuff about how do you really make this learning in the flow work. So that's my little short pitch on that one. And we've got a couple of minutes. So I guess it's question time so should we feel those via the chat window steve is that the best way imogen should we do that if you've got questions particularly you can just drop those in yeah let's, let's go for it. anyone that's got any question let's go for it and thank you for the thank yous guys there that's really appreciated it's just good hanging around with these so um thank you to those of you who are saying thank you as well it's always a tight hour on these things but hopefully there's some real something that just caught your imagination or your thinking so any questions you want to ask this is a time for a free bit of uh, i was going to say consultancy so, so I, I big, big question i mean will there be some copies of the book at our event next next week at the Fuse Tribe event, I can yeah I can arrange for those, so that's absolutely fine. So um, I think we I think we might have even talked about that now, but I will talk with your guys on this. And guys, take that code, do a screenshot of it because um, I'm not widely publicising that, and you can um, yeah you can you can you can get your discount with that one, which is uh, a gift from me to you. So let's have a quick look. Um, Yuta says, how do you use compliance training to transform learning? Um, I. I think compliance training is a really interesting one. What I've seen really effective stuff around that, it comes back to some of what Steve said around narratives. Some of the most energizing compliance training actually really contextualizes the compliance issues in the workplace. So rather than doing some dry old GDPR thing, we actually understand about the importance of using data properly. So I would say on that one, get the narratives working in compliance training, not just tick box activities. Go and get some great stories around that one. Um, what have we got as well? Vivi says, thank you. Yeah, peer-to-peer -peer definitely does rock. Um, I missed the description of the content in the 7C. So on that one, um, Linda, seed your learning communities with great content. Go and curate some stuff. But more more importantly, get the community to go and find great stuff to share it. You might have to help on some of the quality control, but just, yeah, be aware that the content is a way of spiking the community. Uh, will there be a learning package based around the content of the book? I'm doing webinars at the minute, David. So we're early days on this. It's only just out. So, um, yep, um, there may well be, but the minute the book is the way to go at the minute. And bless, you know, I still it's, I still actually like holding a book sometimes. So that's kind of good. Rachel says, how to combine courses with Zoom effectively if we want a combination of being in the room while others want to Zoom in remotely. Yeah, do you know, there's a whole thing around designing great webinars, which is about engagement, those kind of things. There's lots of stuff around great webinars. But, do you know, I made a huge assumption at the Housing Association Association I was at that people actually knew how to engage in webinars and they didn't so we actually made um, engaging in webinars part of our induction
education program because it was quite important for us. Um, so yeah, so think about uh, empowering people to do that. Thank you, David, for buying the book and the supporting. That's really appreciated. Nina says, I see the roles in L&D, totally understand new skills, but it's overwhelming. Where do I start? Okay, what I would do probably, Nina, is have a think through, do a bit of an audit as to where you think. And if you're not sure where to start, start with performance consulting because that underpins so much of it. Um, in the book, I've, I've done a, a, a precy of six consulting models there. So I would say if you're not quite sure, get your consulting skills up. Okay, I think we need to be conscious. We're, we're a minute. Oh, we're, we're up to time. I'm kind of ha happy to hang around, but I'm really conscious. We're doing learning in the flow of work here, and some of you will have something in Outlook. So, um, a massive thank you from me to the Fuse guys for giving me the chance to do this. And I trust that's been a really useful hour. And massive thank you, and hope it's provoked your thinking. Yeah, and, and I think to you, Andy. I think I think thank you so much for um, giving us the opportunity, and thanks for letting us know that, that we at Fuse and all of our, our customers and our partners who are on this call, we're not crazy because sometimes we, we know we're in a different direction. So it's great that you come in and confirm that if we are crazy, then you're crazy as well. And glad to be crazy. And we probably need to be to shift the dial on learning. So let's, let's hang around in a crazy place together. I'm really happy to do that. Cheers, Andy. Thank you so yeah, much. Thanks so much. Okay. Bye for now, everybody. Have a really good afternoon. Cheers, guys.